Thank you, Malcolm. And uh, it is quite surprising to see huge numbers on a wet Tuesday morning. Um, and it's a great privilege for me uh, to say a few words, not only about making more of the North Sea, but maybe say a few words about what Shell are doing in the UK um, with, a, with a passing reference to some of, some of our history, but um, a bit more detail about what we plan to do in the future. The picture here, um, and didn't you all love that film? I, I detected a Scottish version of the West Wing for in the music somewhere, but it was pretty inspiring stuff. The picture here is, um, is the Ocean Guardian. It, um, it's a rig we contracted in July. It's um, in its final stages there of, of a refit at Invergordon. It had come to us from, uh, from the Falkland Islands, and it's um, embarked on what is the longest continuous drilling campaign Shell has undertaken as operator in, in a decade. It's going to drill the nine wells that will represent the subsea part of the Fram development in the Central North Sea. So a few words about what a Shell up to. Um, not surprisingly, as a company, we continue to aim high. We want to be the world's most competitive and innovative energy company, and we plan to grow as a fully integrated energy company really by generating uh, a leading performance, not least of which from what we describe as our core engines. And of course, the UK has long been um, and will remain one of the core upstream engines of, of Shell, of Royal Dutch Shell. So together with some of our other heartlands, um, such as the Netherlands, Norway, uh, Malaysia, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, Oman and Brunei, uh, they form what we've aggregated in Shell um, and term the upstream engine. And these engines are really part of our future strategy in that we will expect them to fund globally um, what, what we describe as the, as the growth pipelines. And, and these include continuing a world leading position in integrated gas, um, really growing what is a revolution in our industry and across the globe in terms of energy, the unconventional business. I was saying to Trevor earlier, um, one thing's for sure, this industry can't afford three or four learning curves around the world. We really have to get joined up and learn very rapidly, not only from within our companies, but beyond uh, and from our competitors, our collaborators, the supply chain, um, and our partners. The growth pipelines, pipelines include integrated gas, unconventionals, deep water, and of course, heavy oil. And the future, and the future does offer tremendous opportunities, including places like Iraq and Kazakhstan and Nigeria. But interestingly, and, um, and a challenge to keep our workforce here in Aberdeen, more alluring places such as Brazil, um, or, or indeed Australia. Um, so in the UK, I would say Shell is interwoven with the history of this base, and it's just 40 years ago um, that we discovered the Brent field. It's interesting, um, I was looking back at some records. We acquired the acreage to 1129 block in 1970, and we thought about drilling this well in the middle of the Northern North Sea in 140 meters of water. At that time, no one had ever developed oil in 140 meters of water anywhere in the world, let alone in the harsh conditions of the Northern North Sea. And um, an oil price was $2.30 a barrel. And um, an understanding how the economics might work were frankly just a leap of faith. And of course, since then, um, some 40 billion barrels have been produced, much of it from that region. The first oil date was 1976. It took only five years to develop that giant field. And it produced 450,000 barrels a day at its peak when I started work in the late 70s. Um, and now it represents the industry's biggest decommissioning project. No lesser engineering challenge for our industry. So we continue to have aspirations to grow 
our role as an operator, a leading operator in the UK. Um, we have, this is the largest Shell oil production in Europe. It also has the highest rate of investment for Shell in Europe. We have interest in more than 50 fields. We operate 30 platforms and installations, 30 subsea res reservoirs. We operate uh, one FPSO and, and two others are operated on our behalf. And we have three onshore gas plants, St. Fergus, uh, Moss Moran and Bacton. We also have very significant uh, non-operated or operated by others assets. I had a word with, uh, with Trevor earlier and my future's very much in his hands in terms of uh, redeveloping Shehalian, where we're now 55% equity holders, uh, and Clare, where we have a major interest. We have some uh, 4,000 staff, including directly involved contractors, and this remains a critical piece of business, about 5% of the group's production uh, across the world. So where are we in the North Sea? Well, we produced over 40 billion barrels, but we think there's still somewhere between 14 and 25 to get after. Two thirds of it's gonna be oil, one third of it's gonna be gas. The mid-range is somewhere probably between three quarters, 750 billion and a trillion worth of value to the government. And this is gonna come from improving recovery from existing reservoirs, it's going to come from simple stuff like infill drilling as well as more sophisticated enhanced oil recovery. It's going to come from new discoveries and importantly it's going to come from current discoveries which are only partially or unappraised. However, a high fraction of that prize will remain in the ground without the cooperation of the government. So we had, um, as all of you know, quite a shock last year. There's going to be a budget update tomorrow. The expectation from uh, announcements ahead of that update are potentially 20 additional gas-powered gas -powered stations for the UK. They are the lowest cost, lowest to run, um, and gas is incredibly plentiful. So I think that's good for the UK, I think it's good for Scotland, and I think it's really good for our industry but we do need the field allowances, we do need s tax certainty on decommissioning and securitization, and we do need stability, first and foremost, in this regime. It's uh, been said more than once that the UK is less stable than Venezuela with respect to its fiscal regime. Let me say a few things about Pilot. Um, Pilot is a joint industry government initiative. It has the support both of the Westminster government uh, and the Scottish government. It's very important. It really, at its highest level, says if we checked our corporate logos at the door and behaved as if we ran this whole continental shelf as a business, how could we maximize economic recovery? Both as operators and supply chain members how can we collaborate to work more effectively to achieve that goal? At Shell, together with BP, we're leading one of the key work themes, which is simply that, improve recovery from existing fields. And I have to say it's generated quite a bit of energy, quite a bit of activity and excitement, but not enough, we need more. So one of the key work areas Improved primary recovery has looked at how do we get the cost base down? One of the things we have discovered from our work in the Netherlands is just what an incredible, incredible enabler a cost reduction in drilling and development can be. So in onshore Netherlands, we brought in a light land rig, we reduced the cost of drilling almost by half, and, and from having zero economic targets, um, we had 70, and we've maintained that inventory over the last several years. We're trying hard to replicate that in the southern North Sea with a low-cost jack-up, and we're trying hard to see ways in which we can jointly get simpler wells, simpler um, subsea solutions, and basically look 
more collaboratively about how we can share workbooks, well intervention vessels, rigs, potentially spare parts to reduce cost, reduce waiting time and start to really tackle one of the fundamental barriers to achieving maximum recovery, that's cost. Data acquisition is really about opportunity identification. At Shell we've managed over 75% of our reservoirs with 4D seismic coverage. Five or ten years ago we agonized for months on the value of information and I can tell you uh, it was largely a waste of time. The brightest brains in the company came back with all kinds of reasons why maybe it was going to be worthwhile and I think in every case it's been worthwhile for reasons we had never forecast. In other words, you find that things about that reservoir that you're never going to know until you've shot the data. Um, but you are going to find opportunities for recompletes, infills, and particularly um, redevelopments that are extremely um, valuable and I think are a differentiator in this basin where seismic data has been, has been vastly um, valuable. So both in terms of time-lapse seismic, in terms of new seismic techniques, um, I think it's important. We're getting some help with benchmarking in terms of are your reservoirs under drilled? And we're looking at benchmarking around well and reservoir management. So together with um, companies th across Europe, we're looking at how many interventions operators uh, make in their wells. And of course onshore it's almost, we're touching almost every well. Whereas subsea, fewer than 17% are um, subject to intervention, but there's a 96% hit rate of improved recovery and improved production. So are we taking enough risk? Are these also areas for more collaboration? So we've kicked off uh, five areas of collaboration um, across 18 companies and I really invite those who are not involved in pilot uh, to contact Bill Katanak at DEC and say in what ways uh, you would like to get involved either in one of the improved primary recovery themes uh, around better management of our core infrastructure uh, or indeed um, enhanced oil recovery. And in addition, we have an extremely um, busy program around access to infrastructure read, led by Centrica uh, and access to capital for the smaller exploration players who are struggling in that area. So let me talk a little bit about technology which um, I think everybody would agree is a vital enabler. First and foremost, um, those of us who are working aging infrastructure know that we have to get closer and we have to have a deeper understanding of our mature assets. And part of that is getting better on inspection um, and getting really to difficult awkward places and really understanding the condition of our assets. I mean, in the Central North Sea, platforms like Nelson, Shearwater, Gannett, mainly built in the early 90s during a low, price, uh, low oil price environment, we had really no expectation that they would last for 40 years. Um, and it's proving a real challenge to ensure that they do. But now, the outlook for many of those fields is we'll be producing beyond 2030 or 2035. So some of the breakthroughs, and in fact those who were at the awards dinner uh, a few weeks ago saw a great story I thought um, with a couple of lads who were rope access technicians who came up with the Cyberhawk um, which is a, basically a, a radio controlled drone which can access hazardous and difficult areas either under deck or in the case of uh, some of the Brent Delta work at the top of the, uh, top of the derrick. So avoiding shutdowns which are costly and avoiding uh, people risking life and limb of course in hazardous work, we get very detailed and very interesting uh, data and the future is attaching thermal imaging, gas detection and potentially down the road non-destructive testing to an entirely re remote operation. We also saw a nomination for the Innovation Award around hot bolting. Again, those, who've, those of us who've had to shut down production um, to service 
flangers know that um, this is an incredibly powerful and valuable improvement to safely eliminating corroded bolts and then coating technology. I think we've calculated we need three million offshore man hours over the next several years um, to get on top of maintenance around Shearwater and Gannett, uh, two of our core Central North Sea infrastructures. And looking at corrosion under insulation, a well-known costly threat, um, and how to combat it. So coating technologies to tackle corrosion um, and to eliminate that well-known threat. Substances such as pyrogel, the kind of stuff that they just coated the, um, the fourth rail bridge with, I think are gonna be um, incredible and valuable to our industry. This is a busy slide, but I wanna talk about a few things. Um, in terms of advanced seismic, in addition to, uh, G in addition to seismic on, on the Ormond Langer field in Norway, we've put a 175 seabed sensors which will allow us to monitor subsidence as we produce the field, um, giving us a time-lapse insight into when we're gonna need infill drilling and where, uh, and also where we're gonna, and when we're gonna need infield uh, and onshore compression. In terms of well abandonment and decommissioning, we're looking at novel lift technologies. On Brent alone, we have 160 wells to plug and abandon. Um, and getting really efficient at that is a critical cost enabler uh, to deliver a, an attractive um, program. In terms of subsea technology, as many of you know, Aberdeen is a leader and will remain a leader. But looking at subsea water flood, uh, subsea boosters, a whole host of lower cost subsea solutions, looking at bundle and pipeline inspections and leak detection, uh, all incredibly important. In terms of future gas, many of the techniques that have been pioneered in the unconventional realm, such as horizontal drilling, um, low cost multi-fracking, gas fracking, uh, I think will be key enablers for the offshore. So many areas of the Southern North Sea, of course, um, we have greatly under-recovered reservoirs in Seoul Pit, more than two thirds of the gas in place still untouched, and they're the techniques that will unlock that. But again, not without, likely not without some help on the tax side. So unlocking new resources. I, uh, I attended the PETEX Exploration Conference in London last week. There were 2,500 delegates, and the room was teeming and bristling with um, with technology, but uh, I had to remark, the observation was that not enough of them were interpreting the data and finding wells to drill. So we've had two years of the lowest exploration activity um, in 40 years, um, and there's a really urgent need to re-examine the exploration potential of this basin. Meanwhile, we do have a world-leading subsea industry, 40,000 employees, generating six billion in goods and services uh, across some 800 companies. I think um, the export potential is huge. Brazil alone is gonna probably quadruple the number of deep water wells in the next half decade. Just in terms of drilling, um, within Shell, we expect to drill more wells in the next decade than we drilled in the previous 100 years in the unconventional realm. So all areas of drilling, completions, and well services are gonna be a, a massive boom industry. And we've talked quite a bit about seismic. We are a leader, we remain a leader. These are exportable and important skills. So I think the future is, as Malcolm indicated, not without challenge, but we have the wherewithal, we have the skills, we have the infrastructure, um, and I think we have the will to continue to build a world-beating uh, oil and gas industry here. But first and foremost, it's really resting on the health of the North Sea industry, and that's in our hands. So before I close, let me just remind you, we are looking for more recruits to support and help pilot. It is important, 
it's a great opportunity, I think, to see if we can roll our sleeves up and successfully collaborate and achieve, certainly better than we have so far, where average recovery is in the mid-30s. Surely we can get more than half the oil and gas out of these reservoirs. Thank you. Thank you.